Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Brian Lockery. I'm with the uh, International Association of Digital Forensics Investigators, and this is uh, social media uh, forensics and uh, kinds of things that you can look at on your social media sites. And hopefully, in 45 minutes, you'll never use social media again um, because you can see all the things that we investigate on you. Um, keep in mind everything that you put out there is public information, so nothing that we have in our databases or uh, anything confidential. Okay. Um, actually, this is a slideshow we use for um, another presentation, but later on at the end of the show, remind me and I'll give you some links to uh, some, some uh, Google Plus communities that we have and also some uh, other um, gamer accounts and stuff that we have that you can get on. So. Okay, why are we interested in social media forensics? Well, a number of good reasons. We, uh, my background tends to be more in the area of uh, uh, criminal investigations. I'm not law enforcement, but I do workshops and seminars for law enforcement. I've been on both sides of the bench, both uh, on the prosecutor's side and on the defense side. So I've, you know, I've seen uh, um, different instances of how people both prosecute and try to defend cases. I've been involved with missing persons cases where we've used uh, social media to track down where people are or where we think they are, uh, where they've been. It's a good, probably a better analogy. Also, maybe who some of their friends are, so if they've hooked up with some new you know, cult somewhere out in Texas or someplace, we can uh, home in on where they might be. I've done cases for uh, infidelity, obviously, quite a bit of that going on on the, uh, on the internet. Question? Oh, really? Can we uh, get the audio guy to crank up the audio a little bit, too? I'll speak a little louder. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Infidelity is a big thing. We see a lot of that across the, uh, the internet, especially with social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, even some instances on LinkedIn, believe it or not. Um, many of the other speakers here are talking about malware, so I'm not going to talk a whole great deal about malware. You're all malware experts already. However, we, we do see malware spreading through uh, some of the social networks and um, I've been involved in um, both paid and unpaid performances of actually capturing malware off of social media sites for investigation purposes. I actually was um, lucky enough, if that's a word, to, um, to capture the very first Twitter virus that, that went out several years ago, about four or five years ago, where Twitter used to allow you to have virtually anything in your profile page. So somebody came up with a creative little script that would embed a little Java app inside of your profile page and then what you would do is you would invite all, you know, you'd invite all your friends to go look at your profile page which would then infect their profile page and the thing went, you know, viral rather quickly. So there are some instances of, of malware that can, uh, can be traced as well. Certainly there's a number of scams going on on the internet. I don't need to talk much about that. I'm sure you're all aware of that. Instances of fraud, instances of human trafficking. Um, I've been involved in a couple cases of an employee working for a company. Um, the gentleman earlier alluded to this that sometimes companies will have insiders within the company that are collecting information and forwarding that information on to competitors. I had a, a case I did probably four or five years ago where um, a person was working for a company, set up his wife in a competing company, and every time the, comp the company that he worked for would get an RFQ to quote on some project, he would, he would then forward that information to his wife and her company would then um, submit a you know, lower bid for 
the same number of widgets or whatever they were selling. And uh, most of that traffic was done, actually done through email, although there were a few threads that went back and forth through social media as well that we were able to capture. And uh, long story short, by the time he got, uh, he got revealed, not only did he get revealed and his wife get revealed, but all of his girlfriends got revealed too. So um, not only did he end up in jail, but I think he ended up divorced too. So uh, not a happy ending to a story, but it's true. We also get involved with uh, child pornography, obviously. Uh, we, we don't see a lot of that on Facebook or LinkedIn or even Twitter for that regard. A um, little bit on Tumblr, probably not so much anymore now that Yahoo just bought them. I'm sure they're going to clean Tumblr up a little bit. But they're, keep in mind, these are not the only social networks that are out there. We actually have a database of over probably close to 400 different social networks that we that we uh, have accounts on that we use for tracking uh, different things. And uh, I literally probably get an invite to a new social network once or twice a week. I mean, they, they continue to spring up for you know, all kinds of, you name it, everybody's got a social network. I mean, like, you know, people that are out of jobs, people that are looking for jobs, people, you know, the 4-H club, you name it, everybody's got a social network. There's sites like Nang, there's sites like um, groups.com, there's a lot of different, where you can actually create your own social network. So there's, um, actually we use Ning for one of our networks. And, uh, um, actually now we're moving more towards Yammer, which is, is it may use Yammer here in your company. It's kind of an enterprise social network that it's behind closed doors and it's also much more secure than some of the other uh, public social networks like Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook would be. Another big issue that we see is um, illegal media sharing, people sharing movies and um, music through social networks. A lot of um, ISPs are now getting involved in the tracking of that as well as major apartment complexes at uh, college universities like this one. Uh, a lot of times they'll get served with um, um, orders to reveal information about you know, which, which nodes on the networks that they provide. A lot of apartment complexes now provide in-house, um, you know, internet services. So it all goes through one, you know, one big router or one big switch. So we've seen instances where there will be a big crackdown within a, an apartment community, within a college, and uh, pretty much everybody's social media <laughs> accounts become exposed at that point. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is Twitter. How many people here are on Twitter? Probably everybody. Twitter is actually a great source of information for people in the InfoSec world. And, um, and um, some interesting Twitter statistics. And this particular slide here is probably about a year old, so these numbers have probably gone up substantially. On a busy day, Twitter sees about 175 million tweets, probably more like 200 million tweets now. Twitter gets around 300,000 new visitors daily. 62% um, of Twitter users are in the age group of 18 to 34. And every second, 750 tweets are being shared on Twitter. So if you're monitoring the Twitter streams like we do, uh, that's quite a, bit of, uh, quite a bit of traffic that you have to keep track of. Twitter has 140 million active users and sees 340 million tweets per day. Now, I kind of, I don't necessarily agree with the 140 million active users. One thing I see on Twitter is that you see a lot of people that sign up for it and then they'll use it for, you know, like, two weeks and then they never use it again. So I believe they may have 140 million users, but I wouldn't necessarily say they're all active users. And about half the world's Twitter users are from the USA, which is not surprising. 
and 55% uh, of the Twitter users are female. So, interesting statistic there. And the average Twitter user has 27 followers. So, I must not be your average Twitter user because I have 18,000 followers. But I post a lot of jokes, so. Okay. Um, what does a Twitter, one thing that I'm gonna talk about really is some of the syntax, if you will, of, of some of these URLs that are used for some of these social networks. And if this seems like, you know, old school stuff to you, um, bear with me because when we start talking about the actual investigation and when we're running scanners across machines that have been collected as evidence, you know, these are all the different things that we set up, you know, grep expressions and regex expressions and things for, okay? So that's one of the reasons why I'm kind of spend a little bit of time on the syntax of the, uh, the URLs and some of the uh, tokens that are used and such. So this would be a typical uh, Twitter URL syntax, twitter.com slash username or Twitter ID. Okay. The, um, I can't read my own slides here. Some of the um, things, uh, sites that might be associated with a Twitter stream, you might see, for example, TwitPix, um, which is actually a third party photo sharing site that originated prior to Twitter adding their own um, picture photo mechanism, which we'll talk about as well. Um, you could search for like anybody using TwitPix by using that second URL where if you search for Q equals uh, TwitPic, it'll come up with pretty much any URL that uh, um, contains that string, that TwitPic string. So, for example, if you're interested in homing in on people within your geographical area, so to speak, you could um, set up an advanced search on Twitter using a string like that and then qualify it by saying that you want everybody in, you know, Richmond, Virginia within a, you know, 50-mile radius, so to speak. So what that does is it gets you a whole bunch of pictures of people in the area that are doing things. Um, why Frog is another popular uh, photo add-on service that people use on Twitter. And um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people now use the embedded uh, Twitter photo sharing system. And it used to be that a lot of people used Instagram with Twitter up until the time that Facebook bought Instagram and the relationship between Facebook and Twitter kind of went south, and uh, I think um, somebody pulled the plug. I'm not sure if it was Twitter or Facebook or whatever, but so now you don't see quite as much Instagram links embedded in tweets as you did before. However, we do see a lot of other interesting traffic on Instagram, which I'll talk to to a little bit later. The bottom line there is actually a URL that uh, would point to a picture on Instagram. So if we're doing a scan of a computer or a cell phone or mobile device of some kind, that would be the syntax of the URL that we would want to look for. In our, so we would come up with a regex expression that would map to a URL that would look like that. <coughs> um, there's many, many, many other photo sharing sites and uh, the reason that I kind of go through this whole list is because if you're doing any kind of forensics work, you have to almost try to figure out if that person has an identity on all, on all the photo sharing sites that are out there and there's really hundreds of them and uh, so we, we have some software that will just automatically go out there and start looking for them all over the place. But um, Smug Mug is one, Prosterius is one, Mobile Picture, there's Flickr, there's uh, TwitGoo, Twitter Pics, there's, like I said, there's li literally hundreds of them. So again, for each of these different photo sharing sites, 
you want to make sure that you understand the syntax of the URL if they use any kind of you know hash coding or any kind of embedding of usernames or user numbers and uh, we'll get the usernames and user numbers a little bit later but just keep that in mind when you start you know searching a computer looking for evidence that these are just some of the keywords that you have to search for as well. <clears throat> okay, so for example, if um, if Moshe, uh, Michelle Obama would post a photo using the Twitter photo sharing service, the um, the syntax of the URL that you would discover would look um, something pretty similar to Wine Three there, and. Uh, Pay close attention to that number because that number will be key for other things. You can uh, actually trace this back to a status message or you can trace it back to, um, to um, other artifacts as well. And again, you have a similar kind of uh, instance on YFrog and unfortunately I don't have an exact number of that, but if you just go look at a YFrog account, you can get one. And then Instagram, you have a slash P slash hash code, and that, uh, that, that slash P means um, photo, I believe, or it means profile, one of the two, and then you have the uh, code for the photo, okay? So... So in any, in any kind of investigation, we may have one or two pieces of evidence. For example, we might have a URL that's stored on a computer out in a browser cache, for example, or we may have the actual photograph itself. And what we want to be able to do is, now if we have the URL, it's pretty easy to go get the photo because we can just go to the internet, get the photo, and match the two up. If we just have the photo and we don't have the URL, then we have to use some reverse techniques, which I'll talk to you about a little bit later. Okay, Twitter also has a new video network called Vine.co. Not com, just .co. Has anybody ever here used Vine? Okay. Vine is a... Uh, sort of what I would call the Twitter version of YouTube. It lets you make, what is it, one, one minute or 30 seconds? Or It's a very short video. It's like limited to something like 60 seconds or something. Um, which, you know, so if you say, you know, hey, I'm at, uh, you know, RVA SEC in Richmond, Virginia. You know, here's the crowd of people out here. That's the most you can do is post you know, one 60-second video, and that's it. But you can post it through your Twitter stream. It's, um, I'm not sure if it's actually owned by Twitter or Twitter is an investor in the company. I think it was founded by a couple of the original founders of Twitter. So if they don't own it outright, they are investors in that company. But, um, you know, like any photo or video sharing service, you know, the it immediately opens up the doors for all kinds of interesting things to happen if you're an investigator um, watching somebody. Um, also keep in mind that a lot of what I'm talking about is things that are relative to the desktop, if you will, to a desktop browser. However, the same concepts and the same tools and the same artifacts apply to mobile devices as well, cell phones. Okay, so if you look at the, you know, the, the, some of the databases that are left on uh, cell phones when you do forensics on them, you have the same kind of information. You might have the image itself, you might have a, a link to the image, you might just have one of these hash codes, et cetera. Okay, okay Twitter also has an RSS feed, so if you are stalking somebody, keeping an eye on them, watching them, whatever it is you do as an investigator. Um, you can set up a reader 
that will continuously monitor their Twitter stream to um, extract their tweets. Twitter is doing away with the RSS feed. So in the last few months, um, I've seen it work on some of our systems, but other systems it doesn't work on. And I think what they're doing is they're, they limit it to um, just to certain IP addresses that are registered Twitter developers. We're actually a registered Twitter developer, so we have, we have some registered IP addresses. But it may not necessarily work on your computer at home. It has been an undocumented feature, um, but for the most part, it, uh, it has worked for the last four or five years just fine. The syntax of that, if you're using wget or any applications like that, is that's the syntax, the middle, the middle lines there. You can also sign up to get a Twitter API, which is, um, allows you to, um, to use some of these services on Twitter that you know, normal non-API people wouldn't have access to. Okay. Another thing that you need to know about a Twitter ID, and this is important for forensics, is that what you see on the screen is a name. For example, you see Michelle Obama as the name, but within the databases themselves, Michelle Obama is assigned a number, and that number actually appears down below. So each, every user has a unique number as well as a screen name. Why that is important to an investigator is because if for some reason she would change her name to you know, Mrs. President or whatever she'd change her name to, her number remains the same, okay? Now, obviously, if she deletes her account and creates a new account, she gets a new number. But if she just changes her name or she just changes her profile image, that number still remains the same. Okay? So when you're doing any kind of an investigation where you're, you're tracking somebody on Twitter, make sure that you, you know, you, if that name no longer shows up in your feed, for example, then you want to go out and do some queries based on that number and see if they've changed that name along the way because, you know, quite honestly, some of the drug dealers and, you know, porn purveyors that we follow, um, you know, they change their name quite often. They change their profile pictures quite often. So, you know, they may do that two or three times a week. And, uh, but we track them using those numbers. You'll see that on other social networks as well, and I'll point it out as we get to them. <clears throat> okay, another um, useful tool within the Twitter domain, useful tools, is it used to be that Twitter would not give you the history of somebody. For example, Twitter would only reveal about the last two or three weeks of their tweets if you did an RSS feed dump on them. Okay, or use the API to do any kind of queries on them. They have since, in the last month or so, opened that up to where you can get a much, 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 much longer uh, tweet history on somebody than what you could before. So you can almost go back a couple of years. There's also some other sites, many other sites, probably 30 or 40 of them out there that I know of, that will actually store tweet histories. And there's a site called topsy.com, T-O-P-S-Y.com, that will store tweet histories, but it only stores the more important things somebody talks about. So for example, if they say, I'm at RVA SEC, you know, 2013 in Richmond, Virginia, and here's a link to my slideshow. Well, that link has significance to it. So it'll actually explode that um, short URL, turn it into a long URL, and then post it with their, um, 
with their tweet. So you can get a lot of back information on somebody by taking a look at uh, topsy.com. Um, Twello, I'm not sure if that site's even still around or not. The, um, again, like everything in the social media world, this stuff comes and goes on a monthly basis. But uh, um, Twello, if it's still around, is also a site that you could get tweet history on. And um, TW Birthday is kind of a, a unique site because it would tell you not the person's birthday, but when they started using Twitter. So you can say, well, this person started using Twitter on, you know, March 21st, 2010, for example. Then you have kind of a, um, you know, a timeline that you can say, well, okay, I want to go back and see how many of those things they've tweeted over the last, you know, couple of years that I can get. And, you know, for example, if you're interested in, GPS information, like where do those tweets originate from, things like that. You can, uh, you can find that. Another site you can use, um, there's one called Twit Business Cards, TWT Business Cards. And these slides will be in my presentation, so you can get that information out of there if you can't read it on the screen. There's another one called Amplicate, and again, I'm not sure if that one's still around or not. And there's another one called TweetReach. Now, TweetReach is based on hash codes. Yeah, 20 minutes, okay. Um, TweetReach is based on hash codes. So DFIR, if you're a Twitter fan, DFIR stands for Digital Forensics Incident Response. I don't know if some, any of you follow that particular hashtag or not. But if you wanna go back and see a whole history of, of DFIR, DFIR hashtags, or InfoSec is a good one, I-N-F-O-S-E-C. You're going to look at the tweet reach. It'll give you a whole history of those, um, of those hashtags. So, for example, one case that I worked on, it happened to be an infidelity case. Um, the... Um, the guy's wife suspected that he was having an affair because he started going to conventions like this one that, you know, he go to like one, used to go to one convention a year. Now he's going to, you know, five or six, seven different conventions. It wasn't information security. It was like lawn care or something. So don't get excited. Um, but anyways, <laughs> anyways, we came up with a pattern of he was there and she was there at all of these conventions. And uh, that was pretty much how we honed in on not only the fact that he was having an affair, but who he was having an affair with. And of course, the next question is, what's her telephone number? And uh, so, but at any rate, um, okay, Facebook. We all love Facebook. And, um, We'll talk a little bit about that. Facebook has, of course, profile information, lots of it, or as much as you give us. It has location information. It has photos. I believe now that Facebook is actually stripping out of photos the GPS information. Does anybody know that? I'm, I'm pretty sure they've, they've started to do that. It used to be you could download somebody, like somebody posted a picture of, a, here's our brand new house. Well, you could tell, you could Google map it based on the GPS information that was in that photo. But I believe they're now stripping that out. Okay. The, um, and of course, you know, we still see every day that uh, Susie and I are going to be going on vacation in, uh, you know, the Bahamas. And our house is going to be empty for the next week. And come on down. So, you know. It's amazing how many people post things like that. Okay, so that said, you also have, um, you know, anything text-based that people post. You have links, and then you have check-ins, which is kind of like GPS information. So if somebody checks into a restaurant or an event like this, for example, or a hotel, I think I checked into the hotel last night, 
um, that's going to show up on your timeline. So if we're building, you know, one of the things that we often do in the world of forensics is we build a timeline analysis. You know, where has this person been? Who has this person been with? You know, how, which, one, which ones of his friends or her friends across the social networks were at the same place at the same time? It's that kind of timeline analysis that, you know, if he checked into a hotel and she checked into a hotel at the same time or within 10 minutes of each other, we get suspicious, okay? So those check-ins can, uh, can be used as evidence as well. And of course, you have all the other artifacts, friends, close friends, family, high school classmates, you name it. You have a lot of apps. Um, I caution you about installing any Facebook application at all. Now you guys are all InfoSec people, so you understand that. But when I talk to school counselors and stuff, they they don't always get it. But um, and of course, you have other artifacts you can look at too, like what pages have they created? What pages have they liked? What groups are they in? Are they in the uh, you know, the ham radio club group, or are they in the, you know, race car fan club or whatever, okay? So you can get a lot of information on the interests of a person based on what groups they're in. And uh, likewise with Twitter, you can get a lot of information on what people are sending out tweets about. There were some rumors that Facebook was going to be launching a dating site. Um, I haven't heard those rumors lately, but that was those were coming out after they went public because you know now they got to make money. But you know if you think about it, all the profile information is there. All the uh, you know it fits the criteria of a dating site nicely, and uh, and like every other business on the internet, they need to make money too. And uh, of course, they now have their promoted posts and other advertising mechanisms. Does anybody use the new Facebook graph search? Anybody know what it is? Anybody heard about it? Okay. If we have time, I'll show you later. It's, it's pretty ingenious if you, uh, if you know how to use it correctly. So it's not open graph. There's a lot of confusion here with developers. It's not their, what they call open graph, and it's not the Facebook graph API. Those are different things. Facebook graph search is, is Facebook's version of Google for finding people. Very interesting. I'll show you that a little bit later. Um, to turn that on, you need to go to this link here, this facebook.com about graph search, blah, 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 because it's an opt-in thing. You can't. You don't get it automatically. You have to enable it for yourself. And this article at the bottom is kind of tells you more and more about what graph search is and how you'd use it, things like that. And that's the page. You just click on the turn on graph search. And um, I apologize that these slides are kind of fuzzy, but hopefully I'll, I'll show it to you in a little bit if I can get an internet connection. Okay, Facebook apps, certainly we have some security concerns, especially when they can see who all your friends are, all your friends of friends, they can get everybody's email addresses. Um, Facebook's security has always been a moving target, continues to be a moving target. Um, a lot of people think that if you unfriend somebody, they can't see your stuff anymore and that's not necessarily true, they may still be able to see your content. So, um, and again, I can't, I can't say, you know, what knobs and switches to set because it, it does, their security model does change all the time. <clears throat> okay, one thing um, that we've seen quite a bit of recently, not only have we seen it on Facebook, we have also seen it on LinkedIn. 10 minutes. Okay, good. Um, and that is somebody clones your account. Okay? It would only take me about 10 minutes if I 
found somebody's account, searching your name or whatever. It would only take me about 10 minutes to clone your account on Facebook or even LinkedIn, clone your picture, clone your profile information, it's all cut and paste, okay? Create a new username entity ID that kind of looks like you with your photo, and then you start sending out all these messages that say, hey, I met you at you know, RVA SEC, I'd love to have you join my LinkedIn page, okay? And what you do is you accumulate lots of new friends. And then you say, hey, you might be interested in downloading this, you know, piece of malware scanner that my buddy wrote. And your buddy's piece of malware scanner turns out to be a piece of malware. Okay. And um, so just keep in mind, if you get an invite from somebody on Facebook or LinkedIn that you think you're already friends with, double check before you add them because it could be an imposter uh, cloning your account. Okay, LinkedIn, we kind of already talked about that. Again, LinkedIn has a, has a uh, syntax to their URLs. It's this ID equals number. Just like Twitter, you have both a username and an ID. So you need to, to cross map that username to the ID um, when appropriate. So LinkedIn also has some other advanced search capabilities where you can search for people just in your area, et cetera. Okay. Uh, Meetup is another group, or I'm sorry, social network that we monitor for people's activity, again, they have members have numbers. Members can belong to multiple meetup groups. Usually they're within the same city or same area, but some meetup groups are actually statewide, some are even national. Okay. People can upload photos to meetup just like they can to Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and everywhere else. So you have to keep track of that. Yeah. Um, we have one that we make available, but I can't, I'm not going to stand up here and sell it to you. Yeah, okay. But if you join our organization, you get it for free. So, <laughs> plug there. Okay. But, or you can use it, you know, you can use whatever grep you want, but most greps don't read binary files or SQL databases and things like that. So, if you, if you want to find all, all of them, you know, you have to come up with some pretty creative software to do that. Um, so this would have been, I'm sorry, I think we probably only got about, what, five minutes left? So, okay, so here's another network, Foursquare, people can check in, so now we know GPS locations. Um, again, I mentioned that a lot of what we see now, most of the investigations we do now, ladies and gentlemen, are on mobile devices. I mean, looking at people's Windows machines for artifacts of data is, you know, two years gone at this point, okay. Um, these mobile apps will keep track of where people have been, even on the phone, even on the phones themselves. Um, Foursquare is a good example. Gowalla is a good example. You get these uh, badges. Notice the arrow down below. I don't know if you can see that or not, but that's a GPS indicator so it knows exactly where you are based on your GPS location. So if you're investigating somebody, that's good information. Um, Yelp, almost the same thing. Yelp is gonna tag you to some restaurant somewhere. That restaurant has an address. That address has a GPS location. Um, Okay, so I'm going to show you a couple of things. One is Google Images. Anybody ever use Google Images to find people? Pretty cute. Normally, I pick on somebody in the audience and I Google them with their picture, but I'm not going to do that because we're running out of time. But I'll use myself. And uh, basically, what you do is you upload a picture of somebody, and it will come out with 
basically all the social networks and everything they're on, if they've used that same picture or a similar picture across all those networks. And I'll give you a demo of that here. If by chance you happen to land on the Nigeria version of the Google site, don't enter your account number there. So it's, you want to stay away from that one. Okay. Um, you know, again, uh, why we worry about all this stuff is that, you know, watch your kids closely. You know, there, there's lots of people watching them, okay? So at this point, let me do the, uh, let me go to, hopefully my, Hopefully my internet connection's still up. So I'll go to my Twitter account, or one of my Twitter accounts. Hey, there we go. See, I really do have 18,000 followers. So I can take my picture here, and I can save this to, to the hard drive. Usually. No, this is just a, this computer can't run uh, PowerPoint and Chrome at the same time. <laughs> I think it's like a 286 or something. Notice, notice the funky file name here. Everybody see that? Okay, we got five minutes left. Down here. Well, try this at home. It's a very funky looking file name. It's just a bunch of like hash code kind of stuff. Okay, um, That's actually significant, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Okay, for those that couldn't see, I just saved a photo of myself. You're lucky. I usually pick on somebody. If I go into Google, more precisely, if I go into images, Down here on the bottom, you see that little camera next to the microphone? Well, if you click on that camera, you can either have, if your internal camera is enabled, you'll have the option of taking a picture, I think. Or you can upload a photo. So I will upload that photo of myself that I just took or just kind of saved to the hard drive. And there we go. Google will automatically find my Twitter account, my, now some of these are not mine. <laughs> so you got you get some false hits. Okay, that's just the nature of the beast. But you'll find my Google Plus profile, you'll find my LinkedIn profile, you'll find my Twitter profile, and my Facebook page, all just because you uploaded that photo. 
You didn't, didn't even have to type my name in. Okay? Now, it'll also come up with some similar looking images, so you can tell those are all very similar to me. So, um, now, getting, getting back to that unique code, we actually have a database of almost 100 million of those unique codes that map the profiles across all the social networks okay, that we make available to, uh, to law enforcement and other people that are doing um, social media forensics investigation work. Okay. Um, so, last but not least, since I only have a few minutes left, I'm going to show you the food porn article here. This is, this is why we do social media investigation. The IRS, your friendly IRS, was able to track down a person wanted for identity theft. I'm not sure why that was the IRS and not the FBI. Well, I do know why. Because they were eating at Morton's Steakhouse and they posted this photo on Instagram. The IRS and the FBI were able to track this guy down and bust him on the spot. Because they knew, you know, they knew his, enough about his social media profile information that all they had to do was keep watching him. And he did enough money laundering that he got to treat himself to a big steak at Morton's Steakhouse. And that now cost him 12 years in jail. So the, the takeaway message here is if you're a criminal, don't spend a lot of time on social media. So, so. Anybody have any questions? Okay, thank you very much.